and uh, Rinka is a small island uh, next to Komodo. So we went yeah. and saw the mm. Komodo dragons on the island of Rinka. Ah, you have uh, watched watch Komodo, uh, yeah? Yeah, so Rinka is another small island very close to Komodo. And we went there. I've also traveled to uh, Kalimantan. Kalimantan? Yes. And yeah, well, uh, you cross, river okay. You you cross Sulawesi Island. So Yes, yes, yes. I uh, we should I would I'm looking forward to coming to Sulawesi as well. <laughs> I see. Okay then. We will invite you very soon. Good, thank you. Okay, shall we begin? Powerek? <laughs> yeah, boleh prof. Yeah. Silakan Hikmayani. We can we can start now. Baik, Pak. Kita mulai ya, Pak ya. Yeah. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. His Excellency, Vice Chancellor for Partnership, Innovation, Entrepreneurship, and Business, Hasanuddin University, Professor Dr. Engineering Adi Maulana, the Honorable Vice Dean for Academic and Student Affairs, Faculty of Animal Science, Hasanuddin University, Dr. Hikma M. Ali, the Honorable Vice Dean for Planning, Resourcer, and alumni Faculty of Animal Science, Hasanuddin University, Dr. Andi Amida Amrawati, the Honorable Vice Dean for Research, Innovation, and Cooperation, Faculty of Animal Science, Hasanuddin University, Dr. Ihsan Andi Dagong, Distinguished Lectures, Faculty of Animal Science, Hasanuddin University, Respected Speaker and Moderator, Students, and all participants. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon. A very warm greeting to each and every one of you. Welcome to General Lecture, fifth edition, with the title Domestic Animal as Model in Functional Genomic and Epigenomic. I'm Hikmayani Iskandar, the MC for the General Lecture. I would like to thank Prof. Yoran Anderson for becoming our speaker today, and I would like to welcome. It's our pleasure to have you as a guest speaker for today, this general lecture participant so far that we have consists of graduate and undergraduate students, lecturers, researchers, and outside of the Faculty of Animal Science. Well, I would like to invite to opening speech from the five counselor for partnership, innovation, entrepreneurship, and business, Hasanuddin University, Professor Dr. Engineering Adi Maulana. At the same time, we also invite for Professor Adi Maulana for opening this general lecture. So, Prof. Adi Maulana, the time is yours. Well, thank you very much, uh, MC Ibu Hikmayani Iskandar. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. A very uh, good afternoon in Indonesia and very good morning in uh, Sweden. The Honorable Dean of Animal Science Faculty of uh, Hasanuddin University, uh, Dr. Sadar Baba, and all Vice Dean, our honored speakers, Professor Goran Andersen from Swedish University of Agriculture, all lecture and students, moderator and all distinguished uh, participants, both online or offline. Thank you for taking the time to join us today in this general lecture. Well, it is my pleasure to open this general lecture uh, with a very thematic issue, I think, domestic animals as models in functional uh, genomics and epigenomics. Uh, this general lecture actually is a part of our world-class webinar program under internationalization uh, program by our university. We know that genomic is very useful in some fields, although I'm not uh, from uh, animal sciences, but I know a bit about uh, genomic, uh, which is very useful actually in uh, uh, forensic tools, predicting diseases, uh, pharmacy, and uh, etc. I think in Indonesia, we have made some progress in genomic study. I read in some uh, report and some journal. 
especially related with domestic animals to support some global issue, particularly related with food security. We do hope from this general lecture, the genomic study field will be more widely spread and understood among our scholar and uh, students, especially in Hasanuddin uh, University. I would like to convey my appreciations to our distinguished speakers today, Professor Goran Anderson. I know from our uh, short conversations today that you have not, you have never been to Makassar, and then uh, we will invite you soon to come to Makassar, because as I mentioned before, that your visit to Indonesia will not be counted. Uh, if you are not uh, visit Makassar. So uh, Professor Goran Anderson, Professor in Molecular Genetic and Bioinformatics, I thank you very much once again for your valuable time and uh, support uh, in contributing to this general lecture. I do hope that uh, yeah, one day you can visit uh, our university physically. And also, I would like to say thank you very much uh, to the steering and organizing uh, committee, especially Faculty of Animal Sciences, uh, Hasanuddin University, and the uh, dean and all vice dean and all lecture for this uh, fruitful collaborations. Mm -hmm. To all my colleagues, uh, both uh, internal UNHAS or external UNHAS, thank you for your organizations of the event. I know that. Uh, this is not easy to conduct such a uh, uh, general lecture like this in these challenging circumstances. We are still in the middle of uh, COVID, but I do hope that uh, the COVID will be over soon. Last but not least, I thank you all participants. And with that, on behalf of Rector of Hasanuddin uh, University, I formally open this general lecture and wish you all success and a productive uh, lecture. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much for Adi for the opening general lecture. So next we are going to the main event today, the general lecture. This session will be led by Dr. Ihsan Andi Dagong to be a moderator. Uh, Dr. Ihsan is a lecturer of Animal Breeding and Genetic Faculty of Animal Science, Hasanuddin University. So, Dr. Ihsan, please, the time is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Hikmayani. So, uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Uh, the Honorable Vice Rector Ho, Professor Adi Molana, and the Honorable Professor Goran Anderson. Nice to meet you today, Prof. Goran. Uh, long, long not to see you. Uh, mm, since see we you. the last the last time we met 2010 I think mm, right. yeah. uh, thank you for good your you your time to uh, share my your, pleasure thank you yes yeah, thank you for your time to share uh, your experience uh, in this uh, general lecture so uh, okay on this occasion allow me to introduce uh, Professor Goran Anderson. Uh, he is uh, a professor in molecular genetic and head of the section of molecular genetic and bioinformatics in Swedish University of Agricultural Science, SLU, Sweden. Uh, his research topic is focused on animals, mainly dog, as a model for complex uh, trade. His research is especially interested in how gene expression are regulated and how that influence trait, such as increase the risk of developing a disease. And his dog research is primarily concerned herd and immune mediated disease. And Prof, uh, Professor Goran also has so, uh, so far has published his research in various international reputable journals like Nature, BMC Genomic, and PLOS uh, One Journal, and many others uh, reputable uh, journal. Okay, uh, that is the brief introduction of Professor Goran, and then I invite Prof. Goran to share his uh, presentation. Okay, thank you very much for your kind introduction. Uh, and... Um... Uh, I uh, so Professor Goran, uh, you will share your uh, slide, or we 
Do you need? Uh, no, Hikmayani will uh, arrange with that. I, okay, I okay. learned. Yeah, right. So thank you, Dr. Isan. Uh, it was very nice seeing you again. Uh, I've had a fruitful collaboration with uh, your former university, Bogor Agricultural University, where I um, worked with Ronny, Dr. Professor Ronny Rachman Noor, and uh, in particular on barley cattle. So the first uh, topic of my general lecture will be a brief discussion about what we found uh, about barley cattle. And uh, okay, so uh, I have been, do you see my presentation now? I don't know. But, um, yeah. Okay, so I have been uh, working with uh, domestic animals for the past almost 25 years, actually. So it has been a lo long, long interest in my research. Uh, and um, uh, I graduated um, from Uppsala University, and I have also worked in the US for uh, roughly five years. And today I will discuss with you um, uh, some some projects that I have selected that I think should be of particular interest for for you uh, regarding domestic animals as models then for functional genomics and epigenomics. So please, next slide. So uh, I I have selected three different studies among several others uh, to illustrate to you the power of genetics, functional genomics, and also epigenomics. And I will describe to you, I understand that there is a broad background of knowledge, so I will try to be as pedagogic as possible. And after my lecture, we will have time for, for questions also. Uh, the first study I will talk about is the uh, genetic uh, of Indonesian cattle. And this is a work that was published more than 10 years ago, but it's, I selected it because it may interest many of you, obviously. Uh, the second study is about uh, our cattle, Bos Taurus. Uh, and uh, uh, as you may know, uh, cattle uh, are often affected by, by inflammatory disease. And we have studied uh, gene expression transcriptomics and also uh, chromatin structure by epigenomics in this situation, in an in vitro model for endometritis in cattle. And I will describe to you that study in study two. And finally, uh, the identification and function of a novel transcription factor in mammals called CBED6, which is one really, really important contribution to the understanding of gene expression regulation. So next slide, please. <clears throat> Uh, okay, so this work that I will present to you today is a collaboration between SLU and mainly Uppsala University. And uh, I have done this work together with Professor Eric Bonkam Rudloff, uh, Dr. Adnan Niasi, Dr. Navid Yamat, Dr. Maria Wilbe, and also Professor Patrice Humblot and Dr. Yongshi Guo uh, at my university. Uh, uh, at Uppsala University, the professors are Leif Andersson and Professor Kerstin Lindblad too. Uh, and our projects, that all the projects that I will describe to you today are funded, were funded and are funded by the Swedish Research Council and the Swedish Council for Sustainable Research and Development. Okay, next slide, please. <clears throat> so the the ori on the origin of Indonesian cattle uh, was published in PLOS One 2009. So it's old data, but it's important for you. And uh, here you see uh, the outline of this study. And uh, as you 
are very familiar with, uh, there are two bovine species in uh, that contribute to Indonesian livestock, the Cebu, Bos Indicus, and the Banteng. And uh, the Indonesian government had uh, approached uh, uh, us uh, to, to define the genetic architecture of, of Indonesian cattle, in particular the Bali cattle. And uh, we decided to perform this molecular analysis then in collaboration with uh, the Bogor Agricultural University. And, uh, and also with um, uh, Dutch scientists, in particular, uh, Johannes Recording Lenz. in progress. Okay, so now I got some information. Recording in progress. Okay, so what we did was uh, analysis, my, uh, mo molecular analysis of the mitochondrial, the Y chromosome, and, and uh, autosomal microsatellite DNA. And we could show that there was um, a, an introgression uh, from Banteng in uh, 10 to 16% of uh, the Indonesian Cebu breeds. And, uh, and that certain breeds had higher autosomal Banteng introgression, uh, up to 20 to 30%. And um, uh, and combine the Cebu paternal lineage with the predominant Madura or Gallican, even complete Gallican, maternal Banteng origin. Uh, and two of the Madura bulls carried Y chromosomal haplotypes from a Bostaurus, the uh, limousine origin. Next slide, please. <clears throat> And very briefly, uh, here is uh, a figure from uh, the paper uh, showing the location of sampling of the uh, Indonesian cattle, and uh, also in the uh, in the circles you can see that, for instance, Bali cattle from Sulawesi were completely bunting, no integration of Cebu. Uh, and in some Cebu breeds, like the on the Aceh on Sumatra, in the region of Aceh, uh, there were some bunting integration. And uh, in Gallican and Madura, as I mentioned, there was uh, in the Gallican there was um, a lot of bunting on the maternal side. Uh, and Bali cattle in Bali was pure. So basically all the Bali cattle populations that we uh, studied were pure Banteng origin. And this was uh, important to, to show to um, uh, the, the, the government uh, because this was one of the main reasons why we performed this to define whether or not the Bali cattle populations in Indonesia were pure bunting, and uh, our conclusion was that yes, it was. Of course, this is a, uh, only a snapshot of the situation at that particular time. Uh, and I know that several other studies have followed up uh, our study. Uh, and uh, I think that to the best of my knowledge, uh, Bali cattle uh, as very important for Indonesia uh, is mainly uh, pure still, but um, we can discuss that later. Okay, so next slide, please. So here is a representation of the genomic components of these Indonesian cattle. And um, uh, the name of the different breeds are listed in the Indian Cebu to the left the Indonesian Cebus in the middle, and then Bali cattle. So based on mitochondrial DNA, Y chromosome, and microsatellites, you can then see the contribution of the different Banteng, Taurin in blue, and Cebu in gray. And uh, we did uh, all the three in Bali and Indonesian Cebu, but we only did the microsatellites, the autosomal microsatellites in the Indian Cebus. 
And as you can see, the majority of the Indian Cebu, except the Red Sindhi, uh, were pure Cebu. There was small contribution of Banteng in Red Sindhi. Uh, and however, in the Indonesian uh, Cebu breeds, there were uh, quite a lot of introgression of the Banteng, as I have already said. Uh, how uh, and then in contrast, the barley cattle from uh, five different, six different locations, uh, five different, sorry, and then also Banteng from uh, the uh, Jakarta Zoo was was list uh, was tested, and they were all pure Banteng. Okay, next slide, please. <clears throat> So here is a neighbor net graph of the genetic distances of these breeds. And you can all see that the barley cattle is uh, very much distant from all these other uh, breeds. Uh, and these breeds, since they are sort of a mixture of, some are pure Cebu and some are mixtures of uh, Bunting and Cebu, they are clustering as expected in this, uh, this genetic analysis. And, um, so it's a nice way of representing the genetic architecture of, of uh, the most important, some of the most important uh, cattle that you have in Indonesia. So we were very pleased with these results and uh, this, the study has been um, uh, well cited over the years. And uh, I have also had other collaborations with the Bogor Agricultural University and in particular with um, uh, a person that you may know, Yulnavati Yusnisar, we studied the spotted uh, buffalo and defined the genetics underlying uh, that particular phenotype. Uh, okay, so this was uh, very shortly, briefly, uh, what we did on Indonesian cattle in study one. Next, I will move on over to uh, our next study. And this was published uh, quite recently in BMC Genomics. Uh, and it was the third paper of a series of papers uh, studying bovine endometrial epithelial cells uh, in vitro as a model to understand uh, endometritis in Bostaurus cattle. And endometritis is caused by um, gram-positive bacteria like uh, E. coli. And it's also a very common problem in uh, females, uh, human females. And so it's also, besides being economically a very large problem in uh, in cattle breeding in, in Europe and North America, and probably also in, in some other countries, uh, our model will help to understand how to defeat this uh, major problem. And um, we started by showing that in these uh, bovine endometrial epithelial cells, we define the transcriptome of of this uh, in a in vitro model where we treated cells with lipopolysaccharide, LPS. And uh, LPS is an outer membrane molecule of E. coli. And it's well known for its ability to induce inflammatory responses in the host. So what, what we have done is that we purify following slaughter we purify these endometrial epithelial cells and we put them in cell culture in the laboratory and we keep them in culture uh, and prove that they are pure epithelial cells uh, of different kinds. Uh, uh, and then we test them by treating them with uh, LPS in this case. We have many other studies where we treat them with other compounds as well. But today I will talk about the, the effect of LPS treatment. And if you look to the right here, uh, I will introduce briefly uh, what differential DNA methylation is. So you see down to the, uh, in the bottom of this um, 
uh, schematic view of DNA and chromosomes. Uh, the ME there is a methylation of a C followed by a, a G, so a cytosine followed by a guanine. And in uh, chromosomes of cattle as well as other mammals and basically all organisms, uh, all eukaryotic organisms, um, there will be a methylation of CPGs. And this controls the compaction of the DNA into the nucleosome first, uh, where the DNA is wrapped around eight molecules of histones. And the histone tails uh, can be methylated or acetylated, removing positive charge from the amino acids uh, in, the, uh, in the histone molecules. And that allows the negatively charged uh, DNA to be wrapped around these histone molecules to compact the DNA. And, and then further on, controlling it into a chromatin fiber, uh, as you see uh, in, above there. And in the nucleus, all the chromosomes are heavily, heavily methylated. We call it hypermethylated. And by, by default, all CPGs will be methylated by a, a series of enzymes called DNA methyl transferases. And uh, this uh, controls the openness or closeness, the closing of the chromatin. So uh, chromatin structure is heavily regulated by DNA methylation and histone acetylation and histone methylation, allowing the chromatin to be compacted into the chromosomes. So in order to uh, open up chromatin, you have to remove these uh, methylation uh, positions, uh, opening up the chromatin, allowing transcription to occur. And this is why we are so interested in defining uh, differential DNA methylation patterns in these endometrial cells follow following uh, treatments of LPS. Okay, so I have a couple of slides from the paper, uh, Yamat paper in BMC Genomics. And I will walk you through it briefly so that you understand. It's kind of com complex, so uh, but I will try to uh, explain the nitty gritty details of it for you. So next slide, please. So what we what we have done here, to the left is uh, we have three different cows. So the, the, B, the bovine endometrial epithelial cells, we abbreviate BEEC, are taking them from uh, cow one, two, and three. And then we uh, uh, show the result after, no, 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 uh, keep this slide, please. Uh, we, mm, we then treat the cells in vitro with either eight or two, two microgram or eight microgram of LPS for 24 hours. And as control, we have cells in the same um, length, 24 hours without LPS treatment. Uh, and then we have also uh, cells from the start, zero hour. And then we plot uh, a principal component analysis where we look at overall DNA methylation status. And as you can see, the three cows cluster uh, separately. So mainly the PCA shows that different individuals have different DNA methylation patterns. We can also observe that treatment of um, uh, the cows with LPS uh, activates uh, DNA methylation, uh, makes, uh, not activates, it, it changes DNA methylation pattern. Uh, so at the, uh, the different PC, the PC1 explains 21% of the variation, 
and uh, PC2 16% uh, variation. And it also separates the cows. So we know that the, the individuals have uh, different methylation patterns, but also that the induction of uh, DNA methylation, the changing uh, of DNA methylation uh, follows uh, a, a quite similar route in these individuals. And um, the, there is uh, LPS overall um, has no strong effect on the overall methylation pattern. So you have to consider the method also that we have used to define the, the DNA methylation. And this is called a reduced representation, uh, reduced representation by sulfite sequencing. So what you basically do, you prepare your genomic DNA and from these different cows, uh, the BEC cells from these different cows, before and after LPS treatment. And then you digest the genomic DNA with the restriction enzyme that uh, is methylation insensitive. And that cuts the genomic DNA into small fragments that are then treated uh, by uh, bisulfite. And this bisulfite treatment uh, changes unmethylated CPGs into uracil. So uracil is not common, uh, it's not normally present in DNA, but it's present in RNA, as you know. So these unmethylated Cs are then detected by uh, next generation sequencing based on Illumina sequence methodology. And then you can define uh, the fraction of methylated DNA at CPGs versus unmethylated DNA at CPGs. And this identified what we called differentially methylated regions. And as you see in uh, D, there is both hypermethylation and hypomethylation. So uh, from control to treated, you can see that some CPGs are then methylated, resulting in a hypermethylation pattern, whereas others are removing CPG methylation, causing hypomethylation. And the reduced representation by sulfide sequencing uh, is only looking at certain parts of the genome that are rich in CPG dinucleotides. So it kind of, it's a representation technology specifically targeting regulatory DNA. Sorry. Because regulatory DNA uh, promoters and enhancers that control gene expression pattern are particularly rich in CPG dinucleotides. And these CPG dinucleotides are then detected by this RRBS sequencing by being methylated or not methylated. Uh, and uh, in D, we can also see that the overall DNA methylation pattern between the different cows are, um, are very similar. However, in next figure, we can, in B, we can also see that there is a distribution uh, of differential DNA methylation and where they are and the numbers of them. Uh, and basically, uh, in next slide, please, uh, we can then detect, because we have the Bos Taurus genome reference sequence, so we know where all our differential DNA methylation positions are, uh, how they are distributed uh, between the different 29 autosomes and also the X chromosome. And uh, it's a lot of data here, but we can, if we look at uh, figure A, we can see that the longest autosome, chromosome one, has quite few uh, DMRs, differentially methylated regions. And whereas some other chromosomes, like the X chromosome in the bottom there, 
has a lot of uh, DMRs. So the length of the chromosome uh, is not uh, corresponding to the number of DMRs. So different chromosomes have different numbers of DMRs, basically. Uh, and we can see that uh, the, the, there is an association between DMRs and genes, rather. And this basically uh, is what I told you earlier, that uh, regulatory DNA promoters and enhancers are relatively speaking very close to promoters are next to genes. They are always in the five prime end uh, in a position dependent or uh, localization in the regarding transcription. Uh, so promoters are always five prime of exon one. So there is a linear correlation uh, between uh, uh, gene on the chromosome. Uh, and of course, the DMRs are located in regulatory DNA next to close to genes. Uh, we can see that uh, in, uh, <clears throat> in C that there is a, a, a distribution also uh, that targets CPG regions uh, as expected then. Uh, interestingly, if you look at um, Mm, uh, the plot A here, we see that there is a tendency of very high distribution of differentially methylated regions close to the telomeres of, of many chromosomes. So in, in something we call subtelomeric regions, two million bases from the actual end, there is a significant enrichment of DMRs. And DMRs uh, uh, also um, as you know, the, if they are methylated or non-methylated, will then uh, influence gene expression. And in promoters in particular, it is well established that hypo, lower degree of DNA methylation is correlated with active transcription. So hypomethylation induced by LPS in such promoters will then influence whether or not the gene is expressed. And when we look at mm, in, um, in, uh, in the bottom here, we can see that we target um, certain regions of the CPG islands. And we see that the majority of differentially methylated regions are in CPGI, which is CPG islands, regions that are enriched in CPG dinucleotides. And uh, then we can also see that certain regions within, within the genes are also targeted by uh, this different. Now I hear some, some noise actually. Uh, okay, so next slide, please. <clears throat> so in the in the last picture here, we can see the um, that there is a significant negative association between mean methylation levels and promoter and gene expression. So this is as except uh, as our data corresponds to basically what was um, expected. And we, importantly, we have been able then by the identification of these DMRs, we can then use the differential DNA methylation pattern to correlate that with differential gene expression that we have in exactly the same cell types. Uh, so the, overall, we have identified regulatory regions controlling gene expression of a subset of differentially methylated promoters and enhancers of genes that are critical for the uh, inflammatory response induced by LPS. And this is something that we are very uh, currently uh, focusing on. So what we're doing is we're taking mm, data from the DMRs 
and we're looking at transcription factor binding sites in the promoters and enhancers of the DMRs. And we're looking for transcription factors that are uh, known to bind to these promoter elements. And we currently, I have a postdoc uh, from uh, uh, working on this, uh, from, he's from China. And he is looking in particular at a transcription factor called hypoxia inducible transcription factor. HIF-1 alpha, which appears to be enriched in several of these promoter DMRs that we have identified. And the aim of the, the study currently is to understand how these transcription factors regulate the inflammatory gene expression uh, that we have identified in this study. <clears throat> okay, next slide, please. Uh, so uh, the genes that we have uh, that are then regulated by, okay, now some, someone is drawing something, uh, are, are then listed here by gene ontology. Uh, so the biological processes and also the KEG pathways, you can see that there is a lot of signal transduction activities gene expression, RNA polymerase to regulation. And the main uh, in C, the, the networks that are uh, overexpressed are calcium regulation, MAP kinase signaling, corticotropin releasing hormone signaling, endo endochondrial ossification, uh, WNT, wind signaling, and then SIDS, uh, which is um, severe um, uh, infant death syndrome is called. Uh, so the inflammatory responses uh, mimicked in our in vitro model has identified the major uh, pathways uh, of the inflammatory response. And that will then be of importance then to, to identify targets for uh, the, and development of thera therapies counteracting the negative effects of the inflammatory responses observed in cattle in endometritis. And again, endometritis is a very common problem that negatively influences for, uh, uh, successful pregnancies in the in the in the cattle okay so i think this was the the final slide of uh, topic number two so next slide please uh, the conclusion also yes so it shows that lps altered dna methylation pattern uh, combined with previous data on uh, differential gene expression uh, related to endometrial function confirms that LPS activates this pro-inflammatory mechanism leading to uh, major changes in the immune balance of these cells and allowing us to continue to study this to develop therapies counteracting the negative consequences of endometritis. Okay, so next and final topic of my talk uh, is um, a study that, okay, now I, now the presentation was lost. Okay, so here is a slide showing some successes from genetic association studies. Uh, all the way to causation, which is uh, a not trivial task. And uh, I will talk today about the IGF-2 study in pigs. I have been involved in also the, the myosin heavy chain 3 study in pigs, uh, which influences muscle fiber type composition and intramuscular fat content that was published uh, some year, few years ago. Uh, but the IGF-2 study is depicted here 
uh, to the right. And it's also an epigenetic influence of this because the mutation leading to this uh, is a CPG transition. And uh, all these success stories, uh, five of them here, are mutations in transcriptional regulatory sequences and uh, resulting in epigenetic modifications. Okay, so next slide, please. Uh, you can take next slide again. And next slide. Okay, so this is a, an intercross between the wild boar to the left, the male, and a female domestic large white. So it's a wild boar large white intercross that was uh, done uh, already in 1999 uh, and uh, directed by my colleague Leif Andersson. So this is a long standing project and I have been working with this for some 20 years myself also. And when you do this, you have the F1, the filial generation number one, and there are brother and sister crosses uh, for several generations. And here in the F2 scene down there, you can see the segregation of Mendelian traits like coat color. So this cross was also used to identify the, the, the white coat color of the domestic pig. And you see uh, the various segregation of some pigs there in the F2 generation, they are spotted and some are black as the wild boar. And the idea of using an intercross to map, in this case, growth traits like muscle, is that we can assume that the wild boar is homozygous wild type for all genes required for uh, having a, a, an efficient muscle biology, as well as fat content biology. Uh, in, in mammals with uh, wild populations, they need to be able to store energy as fat. Whereas the domestic population, they have been strongly selected for many, many generations to, to be muscular and to store as little fat as possible. So we can assume that the major genetic uh, factors influencing muscle and fat storage are, uh, have been selected strongly for in the domestic. And they are assumed to be homozygous for all the mutant uh, gene variants. So the F1 individuals, by definition, will be heterozygous in all those uh, uh, gene variants. Okay. Uh, next slide, please. So here, uh, what we have done here is a quantitative trait locus mapping. So anything that can be quantified uh, listed in this box here, lean meat in ham, lean meat mass in ham, muscle area, heart muscle, birth weight, abdominal fat. Uh, anything like can be quantified in all these individuals is then mapped. Uh, the phenotype of that is mapped by uh, genotyping genomic DNA prepared from all these individuals. And uh, the QTL can be then plotted and represented uh, as done here on the left. And the QTL allele from the domestic large white increases muscle content by three to 4% and also reduces subcutaneous fat and increase the size of the heart. And you can see that in this plot, uh, the um, anything above the 0.1% uh, is significant regions on in the chromosomes that are significantly associated with this particular treat, lean meat ham, uh, the red and the lean meat mass in ham, the green. So those two map to the telomere of pig chromosome two. Uh, the phenotype of this particular trait is uh, transmitted by the male only. 
And this, it's important to remember this because this is uh, identifies that uh, the phenotype is contributed only by the male. And this means that the gene that is uh, producing the protein involved is paternally imprinted, meaning that it's only expressed from the chromosome inherited by the male. And in mammals like you and me, uh, we have some 150 genes showing parental imprinting. And uh, I can come back, I will come back to that a little bit later. But looking at the plot here uh, uh, on the pig chromosome too, you have a number of markers and you have to the left, very near the, the telomere, you have uh, the IGF2 gene. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, so the IGF2 is our strong candidate for being uh, mutated in the large white animals. And you can see that the cross that we did, wild boar large white, has also been uh, replicated by three other crosses. Pietran, Large White Meishan, and Hampshire. And they all uh, map to the IGF-2. So IGF-2 is the major locus contributing to muscle mass selected for in domestic pigs. Next slide, please. Uh, and when you have done a QTL mapping with uh, with uh, genetic markers. Uh, the, the way we follow this is to do something called IBD mapping, identity by descent, because we can assume that the mutation that uh, resulted in this phenotype uh, has then been selected for by breeders of pigs for many, many generations until it has, has been almost fixed in the population of pigs used for meat production. And the aim is then to identify a minimum shared haplotype among all those chromosomes associated with the mutant allele. And uh, since recombinations occur in every single generation during meiosis uh, to produce gametes, uh, the original chromosome affected by the mutation will undergo a large number of recombination following several, several generations of breeding. And I will show you in next slide how this, the principle for IBD mapping. So next slide, please. So consider a number of chromosomes in a population and they are listed here as uh, black. And the one that is red is the one affected by the mutation. Next slide. So uh, it becomes from small Q to big Q. So big Q now is a mutation. And if you follow a large number of uh, generations, the original chromosome, big Q chromosome, has now undergone recombination with wild type chromosomes in each generation. And then we look for uh, the minimum region among all the big Q containing chromosomes. And that will map the, mo the minimal shared region along a set of many, many uh, generations, uh, after many, many generations of breeding. So next slide, you can see this yellow bar identify the uh, second chromosome from the right uh, and the fifth chromosome the, in the middle, sharing a, a small region in common. And this small region in common, in next slide, was then sequenced. Uh, next slide, please. So here, this whole region, uh, defined by this IBD mapping is shown at the top here. And then we have resequenced 
15 chromosomes classified as either big Q or small Q. And remember, big Q is the mutation. Uh, and uh, the region of association here uh, is uh, the, the last action of tyrosine hydroxylase. Uh, and tyrosine hydroxylase is an enzyme in the melanin synthesis and can be excluded because it's not expressed in muscle. Insulin is a candidate. Uh, it is paternally expressed in the yolk sac, but not in adult cells in muscle. So it can also be excluded. And IGF-2 is a very complex gene with four different promoters represented here as P1, two, three, and four. And the yellow boxes there are CPG islands. And the red boxes are the exons, one to nine. And uh, exons one to four are five prime UTR exons. And the coding exons are only in exons five, six, seven, eight, and nine. Uh, Sorry, it's only in six, seven, eight, and nine. Uh, and when we resequence this, we can represent the result in GC content. And you see, there is a very high GC content in this region. Uh, the total region is uh, something like 30,000 30, bases. And uh, we have then applied uh, by resequencing, you identified single nucleotide polymorphisms represented by these small bars here. So if you look at uh, in the big Q, the H254 uh, have the same SMPs as uh, in the small Q. Uh, so this maps the minimal shared even further into uh, intron one of IGF2. Uh, you see that the, it ends there with a green bar in the middle of intron one of IGF2. And to the, to the right in LW3, there is a SMP common to the majority of the small Q except the upper one. And this maps it in the uh, exon number nine. And then luckily for us, there was in M220 uh, a point mutation identifying the QTN, the quantitative trait nucleotide, the position that was mutated, uh, giving the, the big Q phenotype. Okay, next slide, please. <clears throat> uh, this representation is showing that the mutation is a G to A transition. So it's a G in the wild type and an A is in the mutant. And the G in the wild type is a CP, it's a C followed by a G actually. So it's a CPG position. And remember the CPG dinucleotide is the nucleotide that can be methylated as I talked about in study number two. So we know that this CPG interacts with a transcription factor and that, that the interaction is methylation sensitive. So it only interacts when it is non-methyl, unmethylated. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so we, we could show that there was a interaction between DNA and protein in the nucleus. So we prepared nuclear protein extract and we did something called electrophoretic mobility shift assay where you can detect the binding of nuclear protein to DNA. And in this case, the DNA was radioactively labeled. And we compared the small Q, the wild type, you can see the CG dinucleotide there in the middle, in comparison to the large white DNA, where the G to A transition is indicated by the red A. So when we uh, uh, allow the wild type to interact with nuclear proteins from muscle cells. There is a complex shifted in the electrophoresis, and this complex is absent in the mutant. So the interaction between the wild type uh, and nuclear protein 
is detectable in vitro in this study. But we don't know what is this protein. So we performed uh, a lot of studies. Uh, we actually worked for this for some five years, actually, until we were able to identify it. And, and in the next slide, please. We finally got a method which was developed by colleagues at the Broad Institute in the US uh, called SILAC, Stable Isotype Labeling with Amino Acids in Cell Culture. So here is, it's kind of complicated, but I will walk you through it. So what you do is basically mimicking the EMSA result, small q uh, to the right wild type, oligonucleotide and a mutated oligonucleotide uh, with an A there. And nuclear extracts were then uh, prepared from cells in culture using normal natural isotopes of amino acids uh, in the medium. And in the heavy extract, the amino acids were labeled as shown there. Arginine was labeled, uh, lysine was labeled. And then this heavy extract proteins were then allowed to interact with streptavidin uh, coated uh, beads uh, with biotinulated oligonucleotide wild type. And it, to the left, the natural isotopes, uh, nuclear extracts prepared from those were also allowed to bind to these beads where the oligonucleotide mutated versus wild type was attached to these beads. And uh, uh, remember the EMSA results from the previous is that it's only the wild type DNA that binds this protein. So mutated will not bind uh, this particular protein. And when this, um, is a, this methodology is called also DNA protein affinity purification, and using liquid chromatography mass spectrometry, one can then isolate proteins binding to the beads, uh, heavy versus mutated. So see if there is a discrimination of protein interaction. So next slide, please. So this is a representation of a protein that was shown, a peptide from a protein that was shown to bind only to the wild type Q, small Q, but not to the big Q. And this was published 2009. And uh, this peptide LGT, etc., was then searched for, uh, it's, an, it's a new protein. No protein uh, that was studied had this particular peptide sequence. And next slide, please. Uh, so it was a little bit frustrating for a while. But eventually, using bioinformatics, we could show that in uh, the human genome paper, in a, you know, one of these uh, unknown proteins, they are usually called C or for something like this. There was a, in a table in the human supplementary information in the human genome paper, there was a C or uh, which no one knew what it was. And we mapped it to a uh, gene called a host gene. It was sitting in intron 1 of a host gene called ZC3H11A. And, and in human, this is on chromosome 1. And the DNA sequence of, you know, this protein that was identified by us was very similar to a DNA transposon. You know, the, the jumping genes of Barbara that was identified by Barbara McClintock in the 1950s. Uh, DNA transposons are, are uh, repetitive DNA sequences that can mobilize themselves by a cut and paste mechanism. <clears throat> so this particular DNA transposon was domesticated, meaning that it is now unable to move. Uh, all DNA transposons have to be able to bind DNA because this is how they are mobilized. They are mobilized by uh, binding. The proteins that they produce can bind DNA, cut out the DNA, transport it to another position, 
binding DNA, proteins are binding DNA again, and they are in, uh, opening up the DNA and integrating the, uh, the DNA that they carry with them. So they are mobilized uh, autonomously, and the, the DNA binding activity of DNA transposons is dependent on sink fingers. So sink finger is the most common domain in DNA binding proteins in eukaryotes. Uh, so the largest family of transcription factors have sink fingers as well. So seabed six was the sixth member of a small family of domesticated DNA transposon. The, the founding member of this family was, is called seabed one, and it's found in Drosophila in the fruit fly. And it controls transcription of DNA polymerase one, the, which is the enzyme that regulates transcription of, uh, uh, so uh, DNA polymerase is the replication enzyme that is required for DNA replication. So it's a very fundamental uh, domestication event of repetitive DNA sequences uh, called DNA transposons. And, and this one, CBEN6, it performs important functions in placental mammals. And it is a novel mammalian transcription factor previously not known. And it is a, we could show in our functional genomics studies that it's a transcriptional repressor of two of the promoters of IGF-2. And it is a transcription effect in skeletal muscle. Okay, next slide, please. So when we look at the CBED6 protein shown here up to the uh, left, in the AC family, it is, uh, uh, it is similar in sequence to the AC families, AC family, whereas other seabed are similar to other families of DNA uh, transposons. So you have a large number, we have a large number of DNA transposons in our genome. Some we know that are domesticated, uh, having been un disabled from their mo uh, mobilization. So they are stuck wherever they are sitting. And in next, next slide, please. We looked at the genome uh, in detail and we can see that the CBEN6 shown here as a black and red bar in the upper. Uh, is produced by intron retention. So it is using the same transcription start site as the host genes, SEDC3H11A. Uh, and when this mRNA is being produced, if intron 1 is spliced out, then this uh, host gene protein is produced. But when it's retentioned, uh, when it's not spliced out, CBED6 is produced. So it hitchhikes on the transcription start site of ZC3H11A. Next slide, please. So in evolution, uh, amino acid sequences are often, in, when you compare proteins between species, are often changing between species. Uh, but this particular protein, CBED6, the DNA binding domain of this protein is 100% conserved among all mammals that we have looked at. And this is a representation of uh, mammals from different uh, uh, families of mammals. And is this degree of sequence conservation is as high as in histones, which are extremely well conserved. So it's a well conserved protein. Uh, next slide, please. And we based on its location in exactly the same position in all mammals, including monotremes and marsupials also. So marsupials like kangaroo and opossum and the monotreme, which is called platypus, uh, the Australian uh, animal, uh, has this uh, integration as well in exactly the same position. But in those two uh, families of, of mammals, it is 
a mutant sequence. So it's a pseudogene in the platypus and the opossum. Uh, so marsupials and monotremes uh, do not express CBEN6. But it's the fact that it's sitting in exactly the same position in all uterian mammals, marsupials and monotremes indicate that it was integrated in a primitive mammal some more than 200 million years ago, prior to the uh, split between the monotreme marsupial and uterian, and also uh, prior to the split, obviously, between marsupials and uterian mammals. So it's a very old integration, and it has been serving uh, its function in all uterian mammals for more than 150 million years. So it's novel in the fact that we have identified it recently, but it's not novel in nature, basically. Uh, okay, next slide, please. <clears throat> so what we did next was uh, functional genomic studies trying to understand uh, how this point mutation, the G2A transition, in intron three of IGF two, uh, could influence transcription because we know that the mutant uh, increased transcription of IGF two three to fourfold, and IGF two is a very potent uh, growth factor for muscle uh, in all tissues of human beings and other mammals. So we decided to define the transcriptional activation potential using an in vitro model called transient transfection with reporter, uh, reporter vectors uh, uh, regulating the expression of luciferase. And luciferase is, as you know, not present in, in, in uh, mammals. It's, uh, in this case, it's from uh, a marine organism. And what you do is you, you take the, this promoter P3, uh, which is called P, Pig F, I, PIGF2 P3, and you uh, put it in front of a luciferase reporter. And then you add on the wild type small Q or the, the mutant big Q and see if this has an effect on P3 transcription. And below here, you see the P3 activity is then uh, repressed both by the wild, uh, by the two different wild type, uh, small Q containing promoter segment, but not by the mutant. So the mutant, remember, uh, doesn't this, uh, the mutant uh, big Q does not bind to CBEN6. So CBEN6 is able to repress transcription. Uh, and to prove that it is CBEN6 protein that does so, we did the next experiment. And by introducing, next slide please. So by introducing small interfering RNA targeting CBEN6 mRNA efficiently removes that mRNA and you know, no CBEN6 protein will be translated. So when you perform that uh, siRNA treatment, you see you remove CBEN6 and then uh, the, uh, the repressor activity of the wild type reporters are removed. So that proves this uh, luciferase assay provides conclusive evidence that CBEN6 is the repressor interacting with the CPG island in IDF2 intron 2. So this was then a very important uh, finding and uh, proving the point that it is this particular protein that does the work. Okay, next slide, please. <clears throat> so um, we then uh, show that it is a repressor and this was then uh, continued to study uh, in another paper by Yang et al. 2014. And uh, the binding is uh, to this site is methylation sensitive. 
and we did something called chip sequencing. Next slide, please. So, uh, so chip chromatin immunoprecipitation sequencing. First, we uh, made an antibody against CBAD6 by injecting peptides from CBAD6 into rabbits and then purifying an antibody, uh, proving in Western blotting that it is specific for CBAD6. We can then use it for uh, chromatin immunoprecipitation sequencing. So what you do in that experiment is that you allow um, in cells grown in culture, uh, you uh, treat these cells by uh, with this antibody, and the antibody will then bind to the protein, and then you fix the the cells, and then you uh, you fixate them, and you prepare DNA. You cut the DNA and you sequence it. So you you chromatin immunoprecipitate down the DNA uh, that has bound to the uh, uh, to CBN6 sitting on DNA, and then you sequence that DNA. And the positive control is that you expect to detect the uh, IGF-2 position, and we did. Uh, the QTN was, uh, was detected. This is the positive control. And the sequence in the wild type is AGGCTCGC. And you see that CTCGC is the consensus motif of all these 2,500 CBN6 binding sites that we were able to detect in these muscle cells. Next slide, please. So when we look at these, all these sites, we could derive the consensus as shown in the previous, but we were interested to look at the histone modification positions at those CBN6 binding sites. And uh, remember from one of the first slides in study two, uh, where you show the nucleosome had this uh, histone tails. And histone tails can be modified by histone acetyltransferases or histone methyltransferases. And this defines something we call the histone code. And different uh, methylation and acetylations of the histone tails at lysines in particular. So, so the first one there, H3K4ME2, means that the lysine position number four, K is lysine, H3 is histone three. So histone three lysine number four is bimethylated. And this is a modification typical for actively transcribed promoters. And this is true for also H3K4 trimethylation, as well as H3K27 acetylation. So when lysine number 27 is acetylated, it is also a mark for active promoters. Whereas the other uh, H3K4 monomethylation is in enhancers, and the two in the big, uh, in the bottom there is repressor marks. Uh, so what what this data show is that the seabed six sites are predominantly actively transcribed in uh, located in actively transcribed promoters, and it represses transcription from those active promoters. So when it is binding, it holds the transcription at a low level. And then once it is activated, uh, it is uh, you know, modified and then uh, lost and uh, re de-repressed, allowing more transcription to occur from an already active chromosome state. So active promoter means that it is in open chromatin and the chromatin is then waiting to become more uh, intensely transcribed. Okay, next slide, please. So this is one of the final slides and it's kind of a model for how it may work. So if you, you, you see the six protein 
function to hold actively transcribed promoters in a kind of repressed state until it is needed. And remember, I mentioned that my postdoc now works on a protein called HIF1-alpha. So HIF1-alpha is also a, a really critical protein, a hypoxia inducible transcription factor, because IGF2 is regulated by HIF1-alpha. And uh, CBED6 has a role in this regulation. And uh, what is interesting is that when the muscle is used, so anytime you go to the gym, uh, you activate the hypoxia inducible transcription of IGF2. So IGF2 is a very potent transcript, uh, potent growth factor to induce proliferation of skeletal muscle cell. So this is the main reason why your muscles start to grow when you go and, and, uh, and do some exercise of some sort. Weightlifting, you, you use your muscle, uh, it results in hypoxia in your muscle tissue, and that activates transcription of, of uh, IGF-2. And uh, one of the main regulators for this is HIF-1-alpha, and one of the other main regulators is CBED-6. Uh, if you get mutation at the target site, you don't get the repression to the left down there. Uh, so in the domestic pig, which has this mutation, they grow three to 4% more muscle per individual. And it is economically a fantastically important uh, mutation because every single pig that is slaughtered will then have more muscle. And, and this is... Um, a naturally occurring mutation. It's not uh, uh, an induced mutation by by any technology. It's something that we know was originating in China and pigs imported from China to Europe in the 1950s have then been introgressed into uh, the, the pig breeds in Europe and uh, it has reached fixation so all pig breeds used for meat production in Europe, they are um, uh, the the mutation is fixed in in those. So it's a it's something we call a selective sweep. Uh, it's economically very important. And now the Chinese they are introducing this mutation in their pig breeds, uh, in, in other pig breeds by CRISPR Cas9 technology. Uh, okay, so uh, the the other thing that controls the activity of CBN6 is when the CPG site is methylated, uh, and then you do not get uh, transcription repression. Uh, you can also downregulate expression of CBN6 protein, and in a mutation, you have a loss of function, obviously, if you delete this. Uh, and uh, next slide, please. I think is one, one of the final slides. Okay, so this particular identification of a Q10 was the first time ever that a single point mutation was identified as a regulatory mutation underlying a quantitative trait locus. And it illustrates, uh, the reason why I'm selecting this is also that it's one of the most important projects I've been involved in. And it illustrates the extraordinary resolution that is achievable in the molecular dissection of complex traits using domestic animal resources, because mutations in domestic animals are identical by descent uh, and uh, proves the point of the mapping power using domestic animals. Uh, a, a similar complex trait in humans could be influenced by thousands of different mutations and will be by therefore very, very difficult to identify. You cannot assume except in certain families that the mutation is identical by descent. And of course, when it comes to monogenic traits, you know, diseases, genetic diseases, where you have a major gene uh, with a strong penetrance of the phenotype, you can identify it in human families by segregation in families. But 
In complex traits, it's much more difficult because the mutations are influenced by uh, the phenotype is are in the phenotypes are influenced by a large number of different mutations, and and uh, different individuals will have different um, different mutations. So it it is uh, that's why partly why domestic animals is such a good model to identify gene variants causing phenotypic uh, changes uh, that uh, for both uh, phenotypic traits like muscle growth, milk production, uh, uh, and also some diseases, obviously. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, so this is what I what I just said, that um, uh, it is um, in humans, you will not have the statistical power to prove such subtle defect effects as three to four percent more muscle. Uh, in experimental organisms like you know mouse, you can induce mutations, uh, but you with, with you will not have this high resolution as identical by descent mapping. Uh, so in farm animals like cattle, pigs, etc., selective sweeps of mutations that have been strongly selected for within a relatively short period, uh, but for many generations, facilitate this identification of causative haplotypes. And uh, this mutation that was uh, identified in uh, the IGF-2 of pigs has then you know, been followed up by many, many, many uh, studies. And this particular paper that we published in Nature uh, has been cited more than 1,000 times, actually. So it's a heavily important study, and therefore I wanted to share it with you today. So next slide, please. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, there are some references here for study one, two, and three. Uh, and in particular, study two have several more papers coming. Study three, uh, I have listed the papers that I have talked about today, but it has also been continued uh, by particular, in particular by Leif Andersson's group. Uh, so several more papers. Currently uh, in study three, uh, I'm uh, interested in uh, looking at the structure and function of CBED6. So we have, in collaboration with a structural biologist, uh, we are looking into the possibility of identifying and defining structural variation in the protein uh, structure. Uh, because we know that it can form different structures. And this is typical for uh, transcriptional regulators. They have uh, intrinsically... Uh, Mo not mobile, but uh, intrinsically disordered domains, uh, unlike the classical alpha helices and beta pleated sheets, regions in this protein can form many different structures. And this is what we're currently interested in today. And uh, I'm looking forward to tell you more about these results in, in, in the future. Okay, thank you again for your attention. Okay, here, if you want to look at my publications, you can go into Google Scholar, for instance, and see uh, my, my, my publications. And the CV um, should work from the SLU site, but if not, I can send it to Hikmayani also. Okay. I haven't checked myself if it still works, this site, particular site. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Goran. Uh, nice presentation. Uh, and then we go to a uh, discussion session. Now uh, I open discussion session and please raise your hand or write your question in the chat menu if you have any uh, question. So Professor Goran, uh, in this general lecture, we almost have uh, around uh, 97 participants. Okay, great. Okay, uh, Oliasani, Oliasani Anissa. 
Do you want to ask Olisani? Okay. Go ahead. Okay, I don't hear your, your voice, Olisani. So, Doctor Isan, uh, if if you maybe if I don't hear it well, you Sorry, can you can you can say the question to me. Okay. Olisani, okay, please. Please go ahead, Olisani. Go go ahead, Alisani. You still unmute. Okay, Alisani. So in the in the chat there is uh, something in in oh, Indonesian, yeah, yeah, I um, think. You, you can you can uh, is there any question for me in the chat while we wait for only sunny okay i will check the question from the chat mm. so there are some links indicated there uh, this link is uh absence presence presence so only sunny will change his uh, hair device first okay so maybe uh, there is an, another uh, participant who to us. Okay. Sariat, please go ahead, Sariat. Okay, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Professor Anderson. Uh, my name is Muhammad Zariat. I am an undergraduate student in Hasanuddin University Animal Science. So I like to ask some questions about your research, especially in study one. Uh, in okay. your research, you use, use uh, method mitochondrial DNA, Y chromosomal, yeah. and micro satellite DNA. Uh, yeah. My question is, what is the benefit and purpose to use these three methods rather than using only one method to determine the origin of uh, Indonesia cattle? Thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you for your question. Uh, the reason why you look at mitochondrial DNA is uh, the maternal inheritance of mitochondria. So mitochondria will define the maternal contribution, right? Uh, mitochondria is exclusively inherited from the maternal line. So the, the sperm does not contribute to mitochondria. Uh, the egg is full of mitochondria, so it's maternal. Uh, y chromosome is, as you know, uh, only in uh, the male. So male contribution comes from the Y chromosome. And then uh, the autosomes are, of course, uh, uh, common between male and female. Uh, so both the egg and, and the sperm has autosomal chromosomes. And at the time when we did this study, we used mi uh, microsatellites. Today, we, you know, if you would do a follow-up study on this, you would use SMPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms. And uh, we would probably sequence by mm. Illumina-based sequencing. Okay, is that, uh, is that okay? Did it answer your question? It's very clear. Thank you, Professor Anderson. Okay. Okay. Paham? Paham? Yes, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Jadi mitokondria DNA itu diwariskan oleh dari jalur uh, maternal ya, seriat dari jalur induk betina. Sedangkan kalau Y kromosom, SRY gene itu dari uh, jalur paternal, dari jalur pejantannya. Jadi kenapa Prof. Gorang ingin melihat dari dua sisi itu? Karena ingin mungkin ingin melihat uh, origin dari ternak kita dari jalur uh, Ibunya dan jalur uh, pejantannya, ya, terlihat. Oke, okay. next, next question. Yes, maybe. Halo. Ya. Yeah. Mula Dianto from Solo City, Central Java. Oke, okay, oke, okay. go ahead. Yes, uh, uh, any question? Uh, what is the method of producing good livestock for... Uh, Genomic and genomic and epigenomic. Thank you. 
Please. Uh, okay. Can Can you please repeat? Yeah. Question? Can you please repeat your your question? So. Yes. Yes. Uh, what is the the methods of production lights too? Yeah. The method of production yes. of livestock. Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, normally it's uh, developing breeding programs, obviously traditional okay. breeding. Uh, so, so we uh, in in Sweden we have, uh, as well as in most other countries, yeah. traditional breeding programs. Uh, you select individuals okay. based on their phenotypic uh, uh, traits. Now, uh, since since quite a large number of uh, years, also okay. in Sweden, okay. you have um, based on genotyping also. So you you genotype the preferred individual. So you have uh, by SI uh, SMPs. So you have genomic selection yes. of individuals. Yeah. So you you of course, but most importantly. Uh, breeding is defined by by careful phenotype data. Yeah, the selection of, of animals is, uh, uh, f you know, I usually say phenotype, you know, it's a very common statement. Phenotype is king, right? But, but genotype is queen. So a king without a queen uh, is not so good. <laughs> so okay. genotype and phenotype are, are important. And of course, genomic selection is a favored methodology now to identify the most uh, beneficial individual bulls in particular in breeding of, of cattle. So we have in, in, uh, in my department, we have the location of something called the Interbull Center. And they are they are heavily involved in in doing genomic prediction by SNP genotyping. But in general, overall in the world, uh, I would say that traditional breeding is the most commonly used uh, selection for livestock. Um, yeah. Okay. So I'm not a breeder myself. I'm a molecular biologist. So so I'm. I'm not. Uh, I don't participate in in uh, you know breeding programs. But based on our molecular data, we provide uh, breeding advice to different breeding organizations for both cattle, horse, and dogs uh, in particular, and also sheep. Uh, so based on our identification of genetic risk factors for various numbers of diseases, we provide breeding advice to, minim, uh, uh, to minimize the allele frequency of the unwanted genetic risk factors that are segregating in different populations of domestic animals. So the molecular experiments that we're doing, the identification of, of disadvantageous gene variants can then be applied into breeding programs to minimize the negative uh, side effects of, uh, of all kinds of, of gene variants that are segregating in the populations, obviously. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, very content your answer. Thank okay. you, Mr. Goran. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Mr. Muladianto. Yeah. So, right. uh, another question from Olisani Anissa. Okay, thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, and I'm sorry for the technical problem. Um, my name is Olisani, a magister's student from Animal Science and Technology Program Study. Um, actually, first, uh, firstly, Prof, I want to admit that I don't familiar with some terms. Uh, that you are presenting because okay. I'm not focusing on the genetic side, but more okay. socio-academic of livestock. But okay. I'm wondering that what what is actually a methylation and how it can contribute to the improvement of the cattle genetics quality. Okay. So and again, also, sorry, I, I have the second I question. Appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, uh, can I we also... take the first question? Can we take the first question first? Okay. Okay. No the, the methylation. Okay. So uh, DNA methylation has evolved to control transcription of 
retrotransposons. So DNA methylation allows chromatin to be condensed into the chromatin fibers. So it is a, a way to a way of nature to uh, control gene expression, basically. So uh, a very efficient way of turning off gene expression is to methylate DNA. And the DNA methylation is um, achieved by a series of enzymes called, I can write it in the chat if you want, uh, see if I can do it, I don't know. Yeah, so DNA, DNA methyltransferases, methyltransferase. So DNA methyltransferases uh, is enzymes that every time a cell uh, divide by mitosis, the newly synthesized DNA strands are methylated at all CPGs that are um, you know, available for, uh, unless they are protected by protein binding. So DNA methylation is a fundamental way of controlling chromatin structure. So the, 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 the way chromatin, open or closed chromatin. And uh, it is, uh, if you look at promoters, you know what a promoter is, I think, uh, you know, a region of the DNA before okay. the coding part that controls whether or not a gene should be actively transcribed or not. So uh, if the promoter is hypomethylated, you know, la lacking DNA methylation, it is correlated with active transcription. So active transcription requires hypomethylation of promoters. And uh, if you look at mo most students of biology, they know that uh, aging individuals are, you know, age, increased age is correlated by shortening of telomere structure. Have you, do you know this? You know, the ends of the chromosome uh, are protected from degradation by telomeres. Uh, but, uh, and that is a pretty strong correlation, but an even stronger correlation is that when you become old, you get less and less DNA methylation. So hypomethylation is uh, a very strong correlate to old, how old we will become. Because when you get older, you get hypomethylation in most of your tissues. And that is correlated with, uh, finally, when this happens, gene expression of unwanted genes will occur. And retrotransposition of the huge family of uh, long interspersed nucleotide elements called line elements. And this causes uh, the plasticity of the genome and a lot of recombination events occur. So uh, the evolution of DNA methylation is to control gene expression, basically. So everything with epigenetics has to do with understanding DNA methylation. Uh, control of gene expression, control of chromatin structure. This is the nature of uh, why we have DNA methylation. Uh, okay, and your next question was? My next question is actually why the hypo-DMRs result in higher gene expression and otherwise hyper-DMRs result in lower gene expression, but okay. I think... Okay, right, I, I think I explained that. So hypo, so low expression in a promoter activates transcription. And uh, when you look at diseases like cancer, uh, there are heavily in cancer development is heavily influenced by differential DNA methylation in CPG islands, and in particular in the CPG island shores at the two ends, you know, like an island has a, sh a shore, right? 
where you go, you know, swim. But uh, the CPG islands, they have two shores, the five prime and three prime ends. And those are particularly differentially methylated when you compare a healthy cell with a tumor cell. So differential DNA methylation is also correlated with cancer development. So, and cancer development is, is characterized by severely different gene expression patterns. So overexpression and underexpression of a large number of different, uh, you know, tumor antigens, etc. Okay, uh, thank you for your questions. And I apologize for using a lot of terminology that may not be... You, you're welcome to send me email with your questions also. So okay. now, now I have a, a long question from uh, um, Amrullah. And that was you, by the way, wasn't it? Yeah. No, that was Alessandro. Amrullah is somewhere else. Sorry. So Amrullah, let me see. I'm continuing my science. Whether all the genes in the body can be used as a reference in the terrific And also, also. Uh, okay, so okay, so phylogenetic. Well, basically, phylogeny requires genetic polymorphism. And if you look at different, we have twenty thousand genes in our body, but we have in, in between all our uh, genes, we have uh, single nucleotide polymorphism. Uh, so uh, roughly. Uh, every 10 KB, there is one position that differ between your maternal and paternal chromosome. And genetic polymorphism is used in phylogenetic analysis, basically. So I personally have been interested a lot in the major histocompatibility complex uh, and in human, uh, in human, it is called uh, the uh, HLA. And HLA is the most polymorphic gene system that we understand in biology. So with hundreds of different alleles in the population, so that human beings, uh, unless you're inbred, you're heterozygote at the HLA genes. And, and uh, polymorphism is the requirement to perform uh, phylogenetic analysis, basically. Uh, so all genes in the body can, in theory, be used, but not if you're homozygous. You know, some genes uh, have very little genetic polymorphism. So therefore, we're using um, genetic markers that are uh, over the entire entire body base, entire uh, genome. Uh, so in association studies today, we either use uh, genome-wide association mapping using uh, high-density SNP arrays. So high-density SNP arrays uh, with more than, in DOG we have now an array with more than 1 million SNPs. So if you think of um, if you think of a, a, a mammalian genome, our, you, the human genome is three times 10 to the nine nucleotides. And if it's, uh, you know, a, a SNP every, I think it's in, in, did I say 10 KB? I meant one KB. Every KB there is a SNP, right? So that means that there will be, uh, if it's 10 KB, it will be, uh, three to ten to three. Every there will be three million. So it's ten KB, three times ten to the six SNP position on average in the human. So you will differ between your parental chromosomes at three million positions. So we have a, a high density array for cattle, Bostaurus. Uh, we have it for. Uh, it's coming, if not already there, for water buffalo, and maybe also for barley cattle and bunting in the future. Okay. 
Okay, so then we have uh, from Mubarak. Uh, what gene you use at mitochondrial? And in the mitochondrial, we use mitochondrial DNA. We use the hypervariable region. So mitochondria is a small, uh, I think, seventeen kb uh, DNA structure, and uh, one region is. Uh, more more polymorphic, so hypervariable. So you use that hypervariable region to assign the mitochondrial genotype. But there are also some some genes in the mitochondria that can be used, but I, I believe it's the mostly used the hypervariable region. Okay, more questions. Okay, uh, is there any question? So, if there is no more uh, question, so Professor Gorang, we have almost two hours valuable uh, general lecture. And maybe we have come to the end of this uh, public lecture. So we uh, uh, we would like to express our highest uh, gratitude and appreciation to you. It was uh, my pleasure. I hope it was yeah. informative. Yeah. And yeah. please don't hesitate to contact me with uh, specific questions if you want by email. Okay. Thank you very much, Prof. Prof. Professor mm -hmm. Goran. Okay, and, thank you very much. Too. Yeah, maybe uh, uh, Hikmayani already told you that uh, next year we we will uh, have uh, international conference. Uh, yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, yeah. We we do hope if you uh, can one of uh, our uh, speakers. I, I would be happy to accept that invitation, but we have we we haven't decided time for this have we yeah yeah yeah, yeah. We, we don't have decided the the time maybe around mars or april yeah that, so so please um, suggest a couple of different times for this and then okay okay i will uh, try to find the the most optimal time for me but, but march we... march is probably good march, yeah. hello march yeah yeah but we we do hope you can come in person Yes, yes, I understand. Yes, I will try. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you very much. Will be, yeah. Yes. Okay. Hello. Okay. Hello. What, Hello. Want the open question again? Okay. 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 Sure. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Yes. Uh, I'm Murat uh, from Super City, Central Java. Simple question. What does healthy life to look like? Does it have to depend on medicine or food? Okay, uh, I guess you need to repeat the question. I, I Simple, didn't really... yeah. What does a healthy life looks look like? Does it have to depend on a design of our food? What does a healthy uh, life? Bisa dalam bahasa bahasa Indonesia. Oh yeah. Ya. Uh, uh, seperti apa ternak yang sehat? Apa harus tergantung obat atau makanan? Oh, okay, okay. So Isan, uh, can you repeat the question? Professor Professor Goran. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Sorry, sorry, Muladian, uh, Pak Muladian Tos, di, diulang dulu. Ya, seperti apa ternak yang, yang sehat, apa harus tergantung obat atau makanan? Oh, Oke, okay. so, Profesor Goran, which, uh, what is your opinion about yes. the, the healthy animal? Ya. Is it uh, must, uh, from their food or because the, the drugs ya. uh, we, we uh, administer to the, the animal? Yes. Uh, my opinion about a healthy animal, yes. and the, the second question was what we administer to, what, what kind of uh, nutrition which, which we get. You, you, based on your opinion, which one is the, the healthy animal, mm -hmm. uh, the animal we give the, the healthy food or we administer with the drug? Yeah. Oh, okay. We, you know, first of all, uh, in in Sweden, we have very strong legislation against the, the use of antibiotics. So uh, antibiotics is not allowed to be used in Sweden for livestock. 
Uh, I know that antibiotics is used heavily in many other countries. And um, the problem with this is that you will get resistant microbi microbiota. You know, you will get resistant yeah. bacteria that will be difficult to cope with. Uh, so if we, if we talk about uh, the more common uh, immune-mediated diseases in cattle, it is the mastitis, mastitis, and endometritis. Uh, and uh, both these are bacterial infections. Uh, and my, the reason why we focus a lot on endometritis is that it is, uh, we're interested in reproduct reproductive performance. So a major uh, prob uh, problem in uh, livestock breeding is that when you get too much inbreeding, you reduce uh, reproduction efficiency. And you also risk, uh, have a risk of, of getting unwanted side effects of uh, homozygosity at certain genes that will not a, an, enable you to uh, defeat mastitis and endometritis. And always in immune mediated defenses, you have, uh, it's important to have high polymorphism at the a MHC. Uh, and in cattle, it's called BOLA, B O L A bovine leukocyte antigen. Uh, it is important to have high genetic variation at the MHC, as well as many other genes, obviously. So our aim, uh, in, if you think of healthy cows, uh, the most common diseases in uh, European cattle is mastitis and, and, uh, and also endometritis. So healthy cows, in my opinion, would be those that do not, that are not affected by, by these diseases. And therefore we have a certain focus on trying to eliminate uh, as much as possible of the unwanted side effect of, of these inflammatory diseases. So that would be my, my but of course there, there are many other disease problems in, in certain uh, populations of uh, of uh, domestic animals and uh, those are mo more um, more more involving uh, you know specific uh, uh, genetic diseases not so many in cattle that i know of but there are many many such in in the other populations like uh, horses dogs cats pigs etc but yeah, so healthy animals are, of course, critical for our uh, livelihood. And um, uh, we, we, our aim is to breed. Uh, in Sweden, we have a very strong legislation uh, for animal health and welfare. And it is actually against the law to breed uh, animals with known genetic uh, diseases or with known diseases, so we we have we we we're trying our best to to have healthy animal populations in our production animals as well yeah. as our uh, companion animals. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, thank you very much. Yes. For your questions, also. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay. So thank you very much, and I look forward to meet meet you later in the next year and um, thank you very much and bye thank bye you, thank you very much thank you for uh, your attention professor gorang uh, wait Prof professor gorang okay uh, so uh, i will give back uh, again to hikmayani okay okay thank you very much dr isan and also thank you very much prof yoran for the wonderful presentation and discussion that already thank gave you. us the insightful lecture about domestic animal as model in functional genomic and epigenomic. Let's give 
a big applause to Prof. Yoran Anderson. Well, uh, we would like to present a certificate of appreciation from the Faculty of Animal Science, Hasanuddin okay. University. We mm -hmm. kindly invite uh, our vice dean, Dr. Isan Dagong, to give the certificate. So, please. Uh, thank you, Hikma. Uh, please share the certificate. Okay, uh, Professor Gorang, okay, uh, we do appreciate for your uh, presentation today. And thank then, you very much. Uh, please uh, accept this certificate. Uh, and thank we, you. we hope we uh, can uh, have a good collaboration. And mm -hmm. next year, maybe we can arrange uh, some collaboration, uh, doing a research or join publication. Thank you very much. Very nice. Thank you very much. I appreciate yeah. it. Thank you very much. And looking yeah, forward to seeing you again. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Okay. Thank you very much, Prof. So hey, bye -bye. That, let's take a picture yeah. together. Take the picture. Uh, we take a picture, no, Professor Gorang. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All participants, may you open your uh, camera? We take a picture. Should I do something? No, no. Yeah. What should I do? Open my picture? No. Yes, yes, like this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thanks to me, Prof. Promise. You're welcome. Bye. 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 And then. Gracias.